good day to all of you uh, to my students in Philo 101 uh, from University of Cebu main campus uh, once again this is Sean Xavier Alquilita your uh, philosophy instructor so we're proceeding to the next chapter which is the freedom morality as well as culture okay Okay, so we'll proceed here. What is freedom? Because some others would say that freedom is something that that there's no one uh, no one binds you. You are free to do whatever you want to do. Um, so if you're in prison, you are not free. But you are, but once if you're being released from the person, you feel freedom. But what is the real essence of freedom? Okay. Um, for Immanuel Kant, uh, philosopher Immanuel Kant, freedom here is defined as a concept which is involved in moral domain. The question, what should I do? And basically, freedom. For Immanuel Kant is based on the principle of autonomy. But anyway, later on, I will uh, be going to elaborate that one further. Okay, so in summary, Kant says that the moral law is only that I know myself as a free person. Uh, freedom is closely linked to the notion of autonomy. That's why, as I've said, it's a rest on the free... Uh, the principle of autonomy which means law itself so freedom falls obedience to a law that I created myself it is therefore respect its commitment to compliance with oneself okay ah. so practical reason legislates of free beings or more precisely, the causality of free beings, thus practical reason is based on freedom and it is freedom. No? <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> That's why. Okay. So there you have it. Next. Okay. So freedom is alone an originated birthright of man. It belongs to him by force of his humanity and is in independent uh, and is independence on the will and coaction of every other in so far as this consists of every other person's freedom. It is that faculty that enlarges the usefulness of all other faculties. So, um, for Immanuel Kant, to act freely um, is to act autonomously. And when you act autonomously, is act according to a law that you have to give yourself or I give myself. You know? It is based on, it starts within you, you know? that uh, it is, starts within you that you have the duty to yourself and to others. So whenever I act according to the laws of nature demands of a social convention, when I pursue pleasure and comfort, I'm not acting freely. To act freely is to simply choose a means to a given end. And to act freely is to choose the end itself for its own sake. Uh, anyway, we'll, uh, uh, I'll be going to elaborate that one later. Okay, because this is central to Immanuel Kant's notion of freedom. Because acting freely or acting autonomously and acting morally 
are one and not the same thing. Okay. Okay, so uh, I'm here to elaborate here the golden rule. The golden rule here is that uh, do unto others as you'd have them do to you. That's from Matthew 7 12, or it's just the same as with Confucius, no? Um, do not do unto others as you would not have them do to you. So, what's the meaning here of the golden rule? So, according to Michael Stephenson, or um, here, that the core of the golden rule is a moral obligation that is to treat others ethically for their sake, not ours. So, in other words, you're going to treat, uh, to treat others ethically for their own sake. Because we're treating the other person as an end, never as a means. So we're treating others, not for ourselves, but for their own selves, but for their own interest. We're treating others for their own interest, not for our interest. Even if it is better than the way they treat us. Why? So what's the reason behind it? Not because it's advantageous but because it is right because that is the right thing to do and because the way we treat others is about who we are it reflects on who we are not for who they are no? not for the others but it reflects on ourselves the way we treat others okay so uh, why is it that I include this the golden rule because the golden rule has something to do with Immanuel Kant's categorical imperative why because Immanuel Kant's categorical imperative is an elaborated version of the golden rule so allow me to proceed to the next slide Okay, freedom and moral acts. So to arrive at the proper understanding of Kant's notion of moral law and the connection between morality, freedom, and reason, let's examine these contrasts. Okay, so based here, you know, two things fill in the mind with ever new and increasing admiration and awe. The oftener and more steadily, we reflect on them, the starry heavens above me, and the moral law within me. And the other one says there that do the right thing because that is the right thing to do. So that is the idea of Immanuel Kant's concept of morality. Okay. So number one is the duty versus inclination. So the only motive of duty is to act according to a law I give myself confers a moral worth to an action so you are going to do this it is because that is the right thing to do so I have the duty to do this because that is the right thing on the on the other hand um, on the other hand I don't do this thing because that is not the right thing to do so any other motive while possibly commendable cannot give an action moral law or moral worth rather okay next categorical imperative versus hypothetical imperative for example um, uh, uh, what I am going here to imagine for example I want to study my lesson because I want to have a flat one grade at the end of the semester and because of this I want to earn uh, I want to earn cum laude or magna cum laude at the end of my course so is there any moral worth 
of that action based on Immanuel Kant? Simply, there is no moral worth. Why? It is because that the that that your studying that the reason behind why you study your lesson it is because of your own self interest your interest to earn a flat one grade and on the other hand uh, your interest to attain the, ha the the highest honor which is the magna or the summa cum laude but for Immanuel Kant there's no moral worth in that action and that is what we call it as hypothetical imperative that is why hypothetical imperative uses instrumental reason so you you use you use the a good action for the purpose of your own self interest but for Immanuel Kant categorical imperative means that you are going to do an act because that is the right thing to do regardless of the consequences regardless of the outcome without self-interest so that is the categorical imperative so that is the duty it's ethics based on duty that is why his philosophy this his moral philosophy is based on the uh, what I call this it is based on uh, deontological ethics from the word deonto which means duty it is an ethics based on duty no? uh, and that is the categorical imperative that's the central uh, in Immanuel Kant's uh, moral philosophy on the other hand is the autonomy versus heteronomy when he says that I am only free when my will is determined autonomously governed by law I give myself so what does it mean here no uh, that the principle of autonomy or I you are only free that uh, uh, what does it mean here that your action is based uh, on your duty no but your action you're doing the right thing um, doing the right thing because that is the right thing to do what you did was right was based on your own personal decision without uh, without um, uh, kung baga walay nang hilabot ni mo walay nagmando ni mo no one uh, uh, no one requested you no one commanded you to do this but the reason behind of doing the good thing was based on your own personal and your own free decision and that is the principle of autonomy but anyway I will give an example about that later Okay, so here, that is why uh, the only thing that is good without qualification is a good will. So if the action would be good solely as a means to do something else, the imperative is hypothetical. If the action is represented as good in itself and therefore necessary for a will which itself and therefore necessary for a will which itself accords with the reason, the imperative is categorical so that is why I've already explained about this a while ago no? that categorical imperative was based on, on uh, that the morality of your action was based on your actions regardless of the consequences regardless of the outcome okay and the action is represented as good in itself and therefore necessary for will which itself and therefore necessary for a will 
which of itself accords with the reason. Okay, that is why categorical imperative is unconditional. As contrary to hypothetical, I want to study my lesson because I want to become a summa cum laude. I want to study my uh, I want to study philo 101 because I want to earn flat one at the end of the by the end of the first semester. So there is already the condition why do you do uh, why you do this uh, why you do such an act but in categorical imperative it simply means that I study my lesson because that is the right thing to do as a student <laughs> because it is my duty as a student it is my duty to study my own lesson so I want to study my lesson because that is the right thing to do regardless of the outcome, regardless of the test results. Either I'll be uh, receiving zero or perfect score, I don't mind it. Wala akong paki dyan. Ito talaga. Uh, what, I'm, what I'm doing is based on my duty as a student and that is the categorical imperative. Okay. Okay. Kant's ethics of duty. No? There are three insights on the basis of Kant's ethical theory. Number one, an action is a moral worth if it is done for the sake of duty. So that is why your actions of moral worth if it is done for the sake of duty without uh, without uh, regardless of the consequences, regardless of the outcome, regardless of the results. And moreover, an action is morally correct if its maxim can become a universal law. So therefore, uh, that the action, that the maxim of your action should become a universal law for everyone. It should become a law for everyone a law for everyone to follow and moreover we are also treating others the other people as an end no uh, treating others as an end never as a mere means so i will explain that later now the ethics of duty acting for the sake of duty is acting without self-interest, acting without concern for consequences, acting without inclination or otherwise. If you act, <clears throat> if you act according to your own interest, consequences or inclination, there is no moral worth of your own action, and that is eventually hypothetical imperative. Okay. Now, these are the three formulations no? uh, of the categorical imperative of Immanuel Kant. No? So there are three components of one categorical imperative. There are three components, three components in one, in one categorical imperative. So it's just like a part, no? It's just like a um, shall I say a cell phone, a part of the cell phone, like a battery, um, a battery, a circuit, a motherboard, a memory that comprises one complete component. But here, um, categorical imperative is being um, elaborated into three formula. Uh, formula you know? The first formula, uh, the first formulation is based on this no? act according to that maxim by which you can at the same time will that it should become a universal law. So that's the first thing. That's the first uh, formulation. So that is based on the 
principle of consistency. So, what does it mean here? So, what does it mean uh, according to that maxim by which you can at the same time will that it should become a universal law? So, the maxim means uh, what is the meaning of this maxim? Maxim means what should be the rule of my action? What should be the principle that guides my action? And that is the maxim. And from that rule, for that principle of that action, it should become a universal law. For example, um, I give you the best example. If I do this, if I do this thing, I should see to it that others should also do the same. And that is the meaning behind it. Do unto others as what you have them do to you. So, for example, uh, oh, for example, you are inside the jeepney. Mm. Even without even without the signage of no smoking and then you are there inside the jeepney you are smoking is there a is there a moral worth in that action definitely no it is because even without without the sign of no smoking you have the duty not to do that inside the jeepney because you are also affecting the health of the passengers uh, passengers inside the jeepney other than you. So that is the base on that. Okay. For example, uh, the maxim should become a universal law. Okay. Let's take this as a universal law principle of consistency. For example, uh, just have to give an example. Okay. Um, smoking inside the jeepney. If you smoke inside the jeepney, I should also, uh, I should also um, uh, conclude that others, every everyone inside the jeepney should smoke. But can you can you qualify or quantify that others would also smoke aside from you? No. So therefore, it cannot be considered as a universal law and that is the base on that okay the next one is the principle of humanity the second formulation act so that you treat humanity whether in your own person or in that of any other always as an end never as a mere means what does it mean so um mana you're treating others with respect so that is the principle of humanity oh uh, bisaya pa ayo pang gamit ng tao in tagalog wag kang gumamit ng iba so the way you treat others that's also the same way that you you're also treating to your own self mm and that's the golden rule, no? So, that the uh, principle of humanity. Okay, next one. This one, the third formulation. The third one, universal acceptability, but actually that is the principle of autonomy. Act only so that the will through its maxims could regard itself at the same time as universally law giving hmm? the maxim should be universally as a lawgiver okay not only a maxim could become a universal law but at the same time as a lawgiver uh, the principle of autonomy for example another example uh, somebody found out a bag left there at the, at the corner of the store 
or just outside the doorpost of the store. And then what is what was inside the bag are uh, full of cash worth uh, 200,000 pesos. So what should be your rule using Kant's, Kant's maxim? So it seems that it is my duty to do the good because that is the right thing to do. Then it is my duty to return this bag to the rightful owner. Mm. Now, that is principle of consistency. Now, on the other hand, the respect for humanity in this example, I would also say that that since that this money is not mine, I have to respect this. It's because that money is not mine. Therefore, I have the duty to return this to the rightful owner because the owner is the owner of that money, not mine. And that money was based from his own. Uh, he earned that money based from his own sweat, not mine. So therefore, I have to respect that one. So that's a principle of humanity. That's the second formulation. The third formulation here is that in the performance of my duty, it, in the performance of my duty of returning this money, this bag worth full of 200,000 pesos, in the performance of my duty, it is my duty to return this uh, money to the rightful owner, then it is based on my own free decision. No? It is based on my own decision. It was also based sa ako ang uh, rason ako. It was based on my own reason, my personal decision, and my free will to return this bag to the rightful owner. Mm. So that is the principle of autonomy. Therefore, freedom for Immanuel Kant is doing, based, uh, is doing the right thing to do. That is the essence of freedom. Freedom is not something that you uh, that you really want to do, but freedom has something to do with doing what is good because that is the right thing to do, and that is Immanuel Kant. Okay, so that is the example here. So. The performance of my duty of doing the good is based on my own free decision. It was based on my own free will and also my actions or my free actions or free choices. My own reason as well. Okay. Okay, so thanks to uh, to Crash Course Philosophy for more uh, explanation concerning about the uh, Kant's categorical imperative. So let us go now to the Christian perspective, to the Catholic perspective about freedom. No? Since that we finished already Manuel Kant, so let us proceed further with the Catholic um, notion about freedom <clears throat> for the Christians for the Catholics freedom is humans greatest quality it is a reflection of our Creator which is God no? freedom is a power rooted in reason and will and to act or not to act to do this or that so to perform deliberate actions 
on one's own responsibility having freedom means having responsibility so therefore when you are free you are responsible so in every action you choose further determines your or determines our character <clears throat> okay question are animals free do they have freedom okay what separates humans from animals number one reason number two is the will reason presupposes the will it is the reason that dictates our will okay now reason is our intellect it is the uh, the seat of reason or intellect the will the seat of our will is the volition it is referring to our moral action moreover our choice to do something either good or evil no now freedom is a power rooted in reason and will to act or not to act good and evil are forged in freedom to the degree that a person reaches higher level of freedom therefore he becomes capable of higher levels of morality the sinful person becomes a slave <coughs> i give um uh, what does it mean here <coughs> for example i give you a concrete example here uh, about freedom and also the bondage of sin or uh, for example uh, an example of uh, uh, lying for example no? so if somebody so if one person is, uh, is already telling you falsehoods lying and eventually if he um, uh, kumbaga, if he keeps enjoying of telling a lie and it, if it is become a habit of telling a lie to others therefore he'll become not a free person why this because he's already under the bondage of sin under the bondage of he's already under the bondage of all lies that is why, as what Christ said, that uh, ano ba yan? Uh, sa John, uh, sa in the Gospel of John, that the truth will set you free. How will you be able to be free if you are already under the bondage of all lies? No. So that is the best example here. That if you are, if you are already a habit, if it becomes a habit of doing evil therefore you will become a slave to evil things and therefore if you're already a slave on that doing something evil therefore you will never be free okay <clears throat> that is why the existence of freedom is um, central no? uh, wait That is why central in the premise of Catholic morality, our secular culture greatly exalts freedom, yet it also questions whether freedom really exists. Okay, freedom and free will. While the existence of freedom is a central premise of Catholic morality, we are not all equally free. We are not all free, equally free. There are many possible limits to our freedom, both internal and external. So, for example, external freedom, freedom from factors outside ourselves that limit or destroy our free will. For example, um, uh, there's a notion called financial freedom. There's uh, many people became financially free it is because that they're already free from debts utang. they're already free from um, they're already 
making more money and they're already uh, making their good investment so therefore in this case they're already free financially free there's some others uh, who are making money through vlogging through the internet um, making money in Facebook making money in YouTube so these are the people who are who are uh, without uh, without having a debt freedom from debt you're making money at the same time you're already freedom from debt and moreover they're not working from 8 to 5 so in that case these are the people who are already financially free you know uh, they just spend the whole day um, la lang but some others comparing to those people working from 8 to 5 just like me from <laughs> a joke um, we consider me as free nah this is going okay uh, that is what we call it external freedom but when you say internal freedom that is a freedom from uh, internal factors that limit our will number one is sin your guilt kung nag guilty ka sa imuhang gibuat so nag guilty ka sa mga ginagawa mo ayan tuloy hindi ka tuloy malaya no? um yeah, for example, we are free, for example, free speech, free speech as being given to us in the Constitution or in our law. You can be free to say something anyone to say, but in internal aspect of it, internal freedom, can you say that you are already free? For example, telling lies. Yeah, you can tell lies to anyone that is your guaranteed free speech but the question is does mean do you mean that you are already free by telling lies no because of this that's why you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free because true freedom is dependent upon truth and you will know the truth the truth will set you free mm. so example telling falsehoods to others true freedom is oriented toward the good that's why as what I've said down no? it's just the same as with Immanuel Kant the principle of autonomy that it should be acting based on duty and the duty to do the good and nothing but the good itself um, we should not understand freedom as a possibility of doing evil because that is not already what we call it freedom but the term is what we call it license you know? so doing whatever you want to do that is not freedom that is license evil enslaves us and diminishes our ability to be free true freedom requires responsibility there's no such thing as irresponsible freedom uh, actually i haven't heard that one okay How is it possible that God's grace can move us freely to make saving acts of faith, hope, and love? Isn't this simply a contradiction? The modern presupposition is that it is simply incompatible with freedom for our will to be moved even moved by God. But Aquinas has an older and, in fact, much richer and deeper account of human freedom. We need to unpack it a little bit. First, the modern understanding. Freedom in a modern understanding often means to choose without constraint, to opt for whatever I determine, or to put it a little more technically, to choose between contraries. 
So I walk into a restaurant and I look at the menu. I have a range of possibilities before me. I could eat chicken or beef or even fish, and I opt for whatever I choose. And if anyone tells me what to choose or pushes me to choose one option rather than another, then it seems like my freedom has been limited or diminished. Now, this modern understanding of the nature of freedom is only partial, and Aquinas would say it's a misleading description of human action. So by thinking with Aquinas, we can go deeper in understanding the human will and thus human freedom. St. Thomas Aquinas would say, in every choice we make, we're aiming at something that we regard as good. And if we don't regard something as good in at least some respect, we'll never choose it. Our will, therefore, is not primarily a faculty of choosing, of opting between contraries. Choice is only one of the acts of the will. The more fundamental feature of the will is that it is a faculty of desiring or even of loving. The will is a rational appetite, and it desires, it hungers for the good. Whatever our minds grasp as good for me, especially as good for me here and now, that is what I will in some measure will for myself. Further, we see that our lives are not simply a series of one individual choice after another. Yesterday I chose beef, today I choose fish. In fact, we engage in larger projects. We aim at some goal and we make many choices in order to arrive at it. So, for example, a student who's going off to university is aiming at obtaining a degree. And so she makes many individual choices in service of that goal. She registers for her classes, she buys her books, she studies for her exams. And an athlete who wants to compete in the Olympics, he'll get up early in the morning in order to train, he might lift weights, eat a special diet, and even if sometimes he doesn't feel like doing those things, he still chooses to do them because his mind apprehends his training as good in view of his end competing in the Olympics. So he chooses those things freely because his will is focused on the end and regards this training as a good means or the best means to get to what he desires. So if we think about this, we begin to see that freedom or our act of free choice is something that emerges from the will as it desires some end as good. And in view of what we desire, we freely choose a fitting action that will lead us to our end. Aquinas would tell us at this point to step back and look at the many ends or goals that human beings can set for themselves and the many individual choices they might make to reach those ends. Some ends are consistent with human flourishing or happiness, but there are other goals that we might mistakenly set out to pursue but that will only lead us to frustration. Aquinas thinks, for example, that pursuing money or power or fame or honor, if you make it your ultimate end, these things, they will not make you truly happy. Whenever we choose a course of action in pursuit of some end that's unworthy of us, something that's not leading us to our true flourishing, we're in a sense acting freely. Yes, it's true, but also, in truth, the more we head away from what's truly good for us, the more limited our lives become. It's possible for you freely to choose to use heroin, for example, the first time you use it. But as you make the choice again and again, most people will find themselves increasingly unfree. Their will will become chained to this desire, and it's a desire that's not worthy of the human creature made in the image of God. What will make us truly happy? In the final analysis, only God is sufficient to quell all our desires, to satisfy us completely, so that there's nothing more left to desire. So only God can be our final end, Aquinas says. And this is the true reason for our freedom, and the only way for our freedom to reach its full amplitude and power. We have the powers of intellect and will so that in this life we would freely know God by faith and love him by supernatural charity. But if we use those powers in order to pursue something incompatible with God, then we're in fact reducing the scope of the human person. We're enchaining our wills 
so that they'll be addicted to what is not good for us. According to Aquinas, every act of sin is a bit like taking heroin. It turns us away from God, our true good, and the only one who can make us truly happy. And what is more, our wills then become focused on some partial created thing, pleasure or money or honor or our own selves, in such a way that we become chained to these things, fixated on them. Indeed, in creating us, God has already ordered us to certain natural goods, which can lead us to some measure of natural happiness, things like the good of friendship, family life, of knowing the truth, living well and according to virtue. The desires for these things are natural to human beings, and our nature is in principle capable of freely choosing the natural means that will lead us towards them. But the highest good of the human person is to dwell in eternal life with God and this is something that is infinitely above our natural capacity. But God, by the gift of his grace that comes to us from Christ, can freely move us to desire and to choose to love God above all things, to believe the words of Christ, to entrust ourselves to the power of his sacraments, to profess the faith of the church. And when we do these things, we are in fact experiencing what our freedom was made for in its full amplitude, to know and thus to love the supreme good for its own sake. For readings, podcasts, and more videos like this, go to Aquinas101.com. While you're there, be sure to sign up for one of our free video courses on Aquinas. And don't forget to like and share with your friends because it matters what you think. Thank you, thank you very much, Thomistic Institute, for the video. So I acknowledge what is one of our reliable source in explaining further about the the topic that is already that is relevant to this. No? Uh, next one is the morality of the human acts. No? Um, what are the differences, or what's the difference between the human acts? and the acts of man or the act of man. So when you say human acts, these are all actions that is based on our full knowledge. Knowledge, there are three, there are three, I have to add one. That is make use of his knowledge, free will, and consent. Mm. These are those acts that is based on our knowledge free will and consent okay knowledge so you are uh, in other words that you are aware of what you're what you're doing no? uh, that is knowledge free will is based on your moral action why you do this thing love your enemy so I love my I love my son I love my wife it's my duty to honor the the, our country that is a human act that is based on my own free will uh, uh, I told uh, telling lies um, setting fake news that is based on the free will another example is the consent no I just want to give an example one of the <coughs> Uh, the DOH secretary has been um, targeted by the by the House as well as from the Senate. It's because according to to him that oh, wala kung kinalaman dyan as a CEO of uh, PhilHealth or as a DOH secretary, hindi ako nag sa mga meetings. But since that you are part of that you are part of the decision making process in the in the field help even though that hindi ka nag sa meeting you are still responsible why it's because you are giving consent to someone who is uh, to someone who attended the meeting in behalf 
of you. So therefore, giving consent is also, you are also responsible. So therefore, you are not escaped from that responsibility. So that is human acts. <coughs> Sorry. The acts of man, on the other hand, does not make use of his intellect or will. No? Um, so his action is natural. For example, uh, breathing, sleeping. For example, sir, kaihiun kay ko sir, mukawas ko sir. Well, of course, as a teacher, I cannot stop him from doing that. It's because um, I have to allow him to do uh, to go to the CR because of that. Why? This because uh, di ko gusto nga ako responsible na ako nga nung nagkasakit ang yung panto because of that. No? But since it is a, an act of man that is something that is beyond his control, then I would allow him to uh, to uh, to shed his own waste to the CR, to the CR, no, breathing, sleeping, sneezing. He was absent is because he got COVID nineteen. Of course, the ka ubo ubo na, oh, well, it's something beyond my beyond our control. So, that is an act of man. One of the basic principles of the wisdom of Thomas Aquinas is that human beings are on a quest for happiness. We're not talking about happiness in the contemporary and superficial sense of the term, which basically equates happiness with feeling good or being in a good mood. We're talking about happiness in a deeper and richer sense. Happiness is the enjoyment of the highest good. God did not design us to settle for shallow, transitory, and superficial things, but designed our nature to seek out goodness in the fullest sense. The main question set before us every moment of our lives is, how? What is the way towards goodness in the deepest and highest sense of the term? In the world of nature around us, the plants and animals seek out their full realization by instinct. Bees gather pollen, Worms crawl around and birds migrate here and there because they have built-in instincts or tendencies to do these things. The animals do not deliberate about what to do or how to do it. Human beings, on the other hand, do think and deliberate about what to do, how to do it, how to live life to the full. Should I leave this job for another? Go to this school or that? Rent an apartment or buy a house? When acts are voluntary and come from just this kind of thinking and willing about what to do, they're called human acts. And human acts are sometimes also called free acts or free choices because they come from our free agency or freedom. One of the most important characteristics of our human nature is that we seek out happiness or the highest good not by instinct alone, like lower animals, but by human acts, by the choices we make. We search for happiness in freedom. All human beings, as such, have the ability to carry out human acts or free choices. But in our society today, there's a vast and bewildering confusion about the meaning of this ability or characteristic of our nature, the meaning of our freedom, we find ourselves confronted with a bewildering variety of options wherever we go, a grocery store, restaurants. Many people think of freedom as the ability to opt blindly for this or that option, or as the ability to live according to impulse and whim, however you feel at the moment. Many people think freedom means we have a right to do just anything we want, 
But all these accounts leave us disoriented and wondering what the real point of life and freedom is. What is the point of freedom? Is freedom really just for the sake of impulse satisfaction or doing whatever you want? Is there no higher purpose to freedom at all? If not, then what's the difference between freedom and license? Did God give us freedom just so that we would live licentiously, you know, without any regard for principles or guidance on the way to true happiness? For Thomas Aquinas, the point of freedom is to choose one's way to happiness, real happiness, the highest and most enjoyable good of all. And every free choice is regarding the ways or means to the true happiness. The whole point of freedom is to choose those ways and means that will actually bring us to what actually is the highest and most enjoyable good of all. This requires learning to see through the many counterfeits and deceptions regarding happiness and the good life, things that look like they'll make us happy, but in the end fail to do so. They only disappoint. For Aquinas, deep within every human heart, there's a process of interaction, a kind of dialogue between our knowledge and our love, our intellect and our will. Human acts issue from out of this dialogue. How does this inner dialogue or dialogue of the heart go? We don't have to go far to answer this question since it takes place within our experience every day. Suppose a friend comes up to you and says, do you want to go to the baseball game this Friday night? First you hear the question with your intellect and immediately compare the proposal with your will. If the proposal meets with a love of baseball, then you spontaneously see the goodness of it and you wish to go to the game. Aquinas calls this wish a simple volition. But wishes are one thing and intentions are another. When a wish arises in our will, the wish confronts a host of circumstances and limits, including other intentions or pre-commitments you might have. You make a judgment of possibility about going. Maybe you have to work or maybe you have a date. In either of these cases, the wish goes no further. But maybe you judge there is nothing standing in the way of going to the game. If so, your wish develops into what Aquinas calls an intention. You resolve to go to the game with your friend. You are pursuing the end. The question now is, by what means? Now there are various ways to get to the game. You can go to the game by your own car, by taxi, by public train, or by walking. First, you might assemble the list of ways to go and deliberate over them. Going by private car makes for a parking problem. Taxis can be expensive. Public trains after baseball games are overcrowded, or it is too far to walk. But then again, private car makes for a pleasant ride to and from the game. Or the walk may not be too far, and it might be a good exercise. One way or another, when compared to the many loves, in your will and reasons in the mind, the batch of ways and means to the game might meet with various forms of inner approval or disapproval of the will. And it is this inner approval or disapproval that makes one say, no, or that's fine, or that sounds great. Eventually, you need to make a decision with your intellect about which way or means you elect to use. The decision is an act of the intellect, judging this way rather than that as the means to take. And the election is an act of the will agreeing to that particular means among others. Having chosen to go by car, for example, you now actually execute the choice you've made. The execution consists of an inner command of the intellect to use your body parts to get into the car and use is the act of the will actually moving your body parts to do so. Now, let's suppose you and your friend are in the car off to the game, or perhaps at the game, or perhaps at some point after the game. At any one of these points, you might reflect upon your experience of the transportation to the game, or of the game itself, or of the choice to go. From out of that reflection comes the question, did I enjoy that? Or was it worth it? Or was this a good idea? 
The answer to the question is called the judgment of fruition. If in your intellect you answer yes, then in your will you enjoy the game. That joy is called fruition. The point of our example is to illustrate the various little acts that take place within the human heart in every free choice. We carry within us this ability to make free choices, and every day of our lives we deploy it. In the depths of our hearts, we're faced with various proposals about good things, and we have many wishes for this or that. We're always forming judgments about whether it is possible or desirable to pursue this or that. And we're always forming or pursuing all sorts of intentions. In our hearts, we also deliberate and decide about ways to pursue our intentions, and we consent to and elect specific means for doing so. And we also make this inner executive command to do this or that. And finally, we reflect upon our pursuits and ask whether they're worth it or whether we enjoy them, or more or less, all of these little acts go on in our hearts, and they go to make up the essence of free agency. And the point of our free agency is to pursue what will really and truly make us happy, what is really and truly the highest good of all. When we understand human acts and freedom this way, we realize the first and most fundamental thing a free agent needs is to know the truth about what is good, what will really and truly satisfy. Only if we know the truth about what is good can we walk towards what will satisfy without walking into a trap or a deception about happiness. Knowing the truth about what is good preserves us from all that. And in this way, the truth will set you free. Free to love and enjoy the one true good that does not disappoint. So what is that one true good? What are you living for? For readings, podcasts, and more videos like this, go to Aquinas101.com. While you're there, be sure to sign up for one of our free video courses on Aquinas. And don't forget to like and share with your friends, because it matters what you think. For St. Thomas Aquinas, morality is about human actions. What makes us human is that we are masters of our action. We can know not only why we act the way we do, which is to say we make choices for reasons, but we can also know that certain things we choose will achieve the reasons for which we choose them. If you need to go to work, you choose to get out of bed, choose to shower, and to get dressed. You choose to eat your breakfast. You choose to get into the car and to drive to work. And you know that each of these activities have a purpose and that they will get you ultimately to work in the morning. We deliberate our choices. Sometimes that deliberation is easy and quick, especially when we have a routine, like the route we drive to work. But sometimes a choice is difficult and requires a period of moral deliberation, sometimes intense moral deliberation. For St. Thomas Aquinas, the moral life is comprised of particular choices, particular actions, strung together by our pursuit of various goals in life, one leading to the next. To get down to the rub of things, we're talking about particular actions and particular choices. That's what morality is first about. Is this or that choice a moral one, a good one? When looking at particular actions, we've taken to speaking as Catholics about what we call the fonts of morality, which is to say the components of every human action. The Catechism of the Catholic Church echoes St. Thomas's teaching on this matter when it says that every human choice has three basic components, the intention, the object, the circumstances. The intention is the very personal reason we're making a choice at all. I intend to quench my thirst. I choose to drink water. I intend to show my love. 
I choose to tell my mother I love you, or I choose to bring her flowers. I intend to grow closer to God, so I choose to pray. I choose to do penance. I choose to worship. The object is the movement, if you will, of the activity we choose. Every activity, whether it's walking or running or speaking or punching, every activity has a purpose that is quite apart from why I choose to do it. So walking gets me from point A to point B. In the language of Aquinas and the Catechism, that's the object of walking, to get to point B. That's its point. Why I'm choosing to walk, where I'm going, that's my intention. It's very common for people to think that we can't judge an action as good or evil apart from somebody's intention. That's generally true, but not always. The intention certainly can tell why someone chooses to do the thing they do, but there are some choices, some activities whose objects are always evil. In one of his encyclicals, Veritatis Splendor, St. John Paul II, following the teaching of St. Thomas Aquinas, taught that some activities are intrinsically evil and no good intention can redeem them. For instance, the choice to kill an innocent person. There is never a reason to do that. No intention can ever make that good. Circumstances are the who, the where, the how, the when of a choice. Sometimes the morality of an act can change depending on where the act is done. For example, there are ways a husband and a wife relate to each other that are moral in the privacy of their own home that wouldn't be moral in Central Park. Also, the when of a choice may change its morality. For instance, how old somebody is with whom you're interacting. You might choose to challenge or correct children differently when they're five from when they're 15. For St. Thomas, any action we choose, any choice, is good and moral if everything about it is good. The intention, why we're doing it, the object, what we're actually doing, and the circumstances. If we intend to deceive somebody, for instance, and we do so while we tell them that we love them, that's immoral. If we intend to do something good and wonderful, like to love someone, but we choose to punch them in anger, that's immoral. It's immoral because punching someone in anger is not a way to demonstrate the intention of love. While the intention is good, the object, the activity, the punching, is not the proper way to achieve that intention. All of our activities fit into a string of future choices, of further goals and further intentions, but we have to judge each action individually on that string because the ends never justify the means. We can never do evil, even for good reasons. We can't because choosing evil activities, regardless of intention, does something to us. While the intention is always deeply personal, what we're still choosing, the activity we choose, is still very personal. And though we can be prevented from doing good things by people, by people who are in authority over us, or people who might even persecute us. We can never be forced to do evil. St. John Paul said, especially if we are prepared to die rather than to do evil. The ultimate gauge here is whether all three of these things, the intention, the object or activity, the circumstances, whether all of these line up with reason, our highest power, what makes us in the image of God and which participates in God's reason, which is to say, apart from ignorance and sometimes stupidity, our choices are truly good when they are in accord with right reason. For readings, podcasts, and more videos like this, go to Aquinas101.com. While you're there, be sure to sign up for one of our free video courses on Aquinas. And don't forget to like and share with your friends because it matters what you think. For St. Thomas Aquinas, morality is Okay, so let's proceed now to the to the next lesson, <clears throat> which is the culture and morality. So 
to begin with, let us begin with the with the definition of culture as what is defined by the father of anthropologists in the name of Edward Tyler. So Edward Tyler um, defined culture or civilization taking its wide ethnographic sense is the complex whole that includes knowledge, belief, art, morals, law, custom, and any, and any other capabilities and habits acquired by a man as a, member, as a member of the society. So therefore, when we say culture, it, it comprises the, the entire, uh, the complex whole, the entire whole that includes uh, the, that includes our knowledge. So how is our knowledge um, the, the basis of our, how we educate ourselves, the basis of our intellect, uh, the belief or belief systems since that Philippines is a predominantly 85% Roman Catholic so and moreover is a religious is a, one of the most religious um, cultures all around Southeast Asia no? uh, with regards to our art our value system considering our morals our laws uh, consider our political aspects, uh, custom, and any other capabilities and habits acquired by men, no? acquired by us, being the members of the society. Okay. So that is why that the culture is derived from the Latin words cultura or cultus, which means uh, from the Latin word that means a care or cultivation. So culture as a cultivation implies that every human being is a potential member of the uh, society, a member of the social group. Okay. And and that's how culture is being defined in an etymological sense. Uh, so that is being um, defined already in the previous slide what culture was defined according to um, Edward Tyler. So in other words, that culture refers to the totality. It, it, um, it refers to the whole, the total, the entirety of the humanly created world. No? Uh, then from material culture and cultivated landscapes by social institutions no? like political, religious, economic, to knowledge and meaning, something that human has created and learned in our in a certain or in our society okay so this is now the culture wheel uh, before I proceed there so this is what um, Edward Tyler really mean about the culture so I give the example here the culture wheel no so it reflects our values our community, their knowledge, or even the stories, uh, uh, literature, language, our traditions, our rituals, techniques, or even our sciences, tools and objects, the arts, food and drink. So, of course, food also, we, uh, our culture is also defined by our by understanding our our own diet no? values like that okay so the influence of culture in the moral development so what is the connection so here we try to connect no? the morality uh, the relationship of culture to morality so here in the moral development the influence of culture in the moral development Culture has been with us since the dawn of the human existence. No? 
because basically um, uh, basically when uh, according to the sociologist the basic uh, when when people living in the nearly the the water forms like the seashore this is where the culture starts it's because there in that certain uh, in that certain situation a food gathering as well as uh, the making of food the belief systems started from there in that area no so that is where the culture is being established in that area so it is being uh, with us no since since the beginning of our human existence okay the next one that culture is a social environment no in which a person is born and where and wherein he or she lives together with the other persons <clears throat> okay so hence culture has a great impact in the development of the human person in varied ways uh, may it be physical knowledge thought relationship religious or moral development so uh, it's a social environment culture is a social environment so in which a person is born so for example i'm here living in cebu city so um, the culture that i'm the culture that is being um, surrounded in me is based on the cebuano culture but my parents came from the it's not a cebuano uh, my mom is from samar and my dad is from davao no so the two different cultures but i'm born here in cebu city but on the other hand <clears throat> excuse me on the other hand i can also speak waray <laughs> because i've been in summer uh for the uh since when i was young no so the culture of the, the philippines has a diverse cultures no most especially when language is concerned language is also a culture uh, waray is different uh, the waray language is somewhat different from the Cebuan or Visayan language mm. even with Tagalog and Cebuanos so later on uh, uh, I may give a short explanation for that okay next culture is a person's social heritage that has been passed from one generation to the next so therefore a culture is a social heritage it can be passed it can so the values that is given to me by my father the values is given to me by my mom i learned all those values and when and since now that i already have a son so the values that is being learned the values that i've been learned and I, I will also going to pass it to my uh, to my next generation to my offspring <clears throat> so that is where culture uh, is be is a social heritage okay next so culture has important characteristics no as i would emphasize that culture is rooted from the collective human experience so culture is always transmitted it is shared or acquired through learning so it is acquired through learning anything that you've learned is also culture it's part of that culture culture satisfies human needs as a social being and culture tends towards the participation of the members of the society so these are the important characteristics that's why as i already mentioned there now culture plays a vital role a vital role in the development
the development of the human person. No? Um, in every aspect of the human person, the cultural background can be very visible. In particular, culture has an essential influence on the moral development of the human person since morality is just one of the cultural uh, aspects. Okay. Okay, so let us particularize how culture influences, influences moral development no? the people. Number one, culture is always social and communal by which the relationship the people towards one another and their experiences of people and the cultures uh, meadow. So it is in this relationship and communal experience that culture influences the moral development of its members. It is important to note that morality as principle is promoted because primarily of the relationship within the community. For example, laws and rules and standards of attitudes and behaviors are set and promulgated by the community to promote that relationship that binds them together as people. So that is why as, um, as uh, when so when the laws are being established, when the values are being established, this is where the people uh, this is where the the behaviors are being shaped. In by those factors, the laws, the rules, even the standards of attitudes. Okay, next, number two. Culture defines the normative principles and behaviors of the society. It defines which particular principle and behavior should be kept and would serve the best interest of the community. So I guess you can uh, already understand this one. Okay. Uh, the third one is culture as best exemplified in experience of the people um, develops restrictions, sets boundaries and limitations as they live and relate to one another. So therefore, it is uh, exemplified in the experience, no? Uh, um, experience as well as observation. Next, culture helps in generating character. So, it generates character. This is where culture can be identified by means of our own characteristics as a member of the society, our own individual characteristics. And from there, it becomes a social character and it defines who we are, our identity. That's why identity of the people and also includes the moral character. A number five, culture identifies the authorities. No, so you know already the authorities, our leadership, our political sphere. Uh, it also identifies our society as an institution. Since uh, there's an authority, the governing individuals or groups, so therefore institutions can also be identified insofar as culture is concerned. Next. So, next one is the dynamics of culture, cultural relativism. So, cross-cultural relationships is the idea that people from different cultures can have relationships that acknowledge, respect, and begin to understand each other's diverse lives. But anyway, later on, I will explain a little bit of explanation about this. A concept of cultural relativism, as we know and use it today, was established as an analytic tool by German-American anthropologist Franz Boas in the early 20th century. Okay. Dynamics of culture.
So cultural relativism is the ability to understand a culture on its own terms and not to make judgments using the standards of one's own culture. No? It is considered to be more constructive and positive conception as compared to ethnocentrism. <clears throat> so just here in the comic strip, um, there are two characters here. The one, uh, the one lady wearing hijab, uh, the Muslim uh, hijab. The 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 culture of covering, no, the entire part of the body. But what is only revealing is your only eyes, no. Uh, if you're going to Arab countries, women, regardless of your religion, if you want to work there. Uh, especially ladies, you are required to wear that one hijab. It's so very hot, no? Compared to the other lady who's wearing two piece, no? So she said, uh, the one wearing a two piece said, everything covered but her eyes. What a cruel male dominated culture. <laughs> the other one is a Muslim says, uh, the lady wearing the hijab, nothing covered. But her eyes, uh, nothing covered but her eyes. <laughs> what a cruel male dominated culture. <laughs> so, here, what does it imply here that in cultural relativism, the culture is very relative, it's not absolute. No, uh, delicia absolute, it's relative. Uh, what is good for one may not good for the other and what is good for the other may not be good to the other one so that is why in its own terms not to make judgments using the standards of one's own culture no um, i will explain that one the best example that one is uh, our religious beliefs no our differences concerning our religious beliefs now uh, let's continue. It is considered to be more constructive and positive conception as compared to ethnocentrism. When you say ethnocentrism, means that my culture is superior, therefore, superior than the rest. So, therefore, uh, this one, this culture is the best. Oh, and, and, and your culture is wrong. Mm. Since that we know, since that we read the Bible, we memorize the Bible from Genesis chapter 1 up to the last chapter of the Revelations, therefore you Catholics considered as below us. Mm. That is ethnocentrism. Since that we know the Bible, we know the, the scripture, we memorize it, therefore we are better than you. Mm, that is ethnocentrism. Okay, next. Okay, cultural relativism. The, the other one here. Uh, try some deep fried crickets. They're so delicious. Mm, I think, mm, yeah. I'll pass. Thanks. <laughs> you know, in in uh, in Thailand, no, uh, in Thailand, uh, if you want to go there in Thailand, they're their culture. So uh, they have their own culture there that eating crickets is also part of their own diet, no. But for us, if you want to go there, oh, you you can uh, you um, hindi mo makaya, no. So here. Uh, it, cultural relativism it is a method or procedure for explaining and interpreting the other's culture so it is widely accepted in modern anthropology so cultural relativists believe that all cultures are worthy of their own right and of equal value so diversity of cultures even those with conflicting moral beliefs is not to be considered in terms of right and wrong, 
good or bad. That is why it's relative. What is good for one may not be good for the other. So everything is relative. There's no standard. Because in morality, the standard of morality as what we have learned in chapter 1, it is based on what is right and what is wrong. No? What is good and what is evil. But in relativism, everything is relative. Everything is just only conventional. There's no right or wrong here. Okay? <laughs> okay. So it is closely related to ethical relativism. So it's a matter related to ethical relativism which views truth as variable and not absolute. Okay. Uh, okay. So, uh, what is right and wrong is determined solely by the individual or by the society. Okay. So, to continue. Okay, so cultural relativism seems, sees nothing inherently wrong and moreover, nothing inherently good with any cultural expression. So the ancient mind practices of self-mutilation and human sacrifice are neither good nor evil. You know? uh, just an example, uh, marriage practices of the Muslims. So the Muslims can marry up to five ladies, no? uh, men, could marry up to five, but should not be judged based on the culture of the Roman Catholics because we as a Christians, we only have only one heart and one lady to marry. The same is also with the religious practice no, of the Roman Catholics of veneration of the images, no? should not be based, judged based on the religious culture of the born again Protestants, INCs, dating daan, and etc. Oh, that is why, guys, to those who are, uh, to those who are non-Catholics here, please, no man, guys, respect, no man. No, it's it's a culture. Um, it's a you cannot say that the, according to the Bible that that is idolatry. Oh, but how about the succeeding chapters of the Exodus, like from? Exodus chapters 27 and 30 when God was ordered Moses to create the Ark of the Covenant, diba? That is an that is a religious image. Okay. So um we uh, that's why guys, we can agree to disagree with this, no? Uh since that that is your standard, that is your standard but you cannot set the standards for ourselves. Oh, oh. That is why we have to go back to the golden rule. Do unto others as you want them to do to you, diba? Mm. So, you should not judge the other faiths based on your own standards. It's because these people, this, this sect, religious sect, they have their own sets of faith, uh, morals, set of faith and morals as part of their own, um, uh, as part of their own spirituality as well as their lifestyle. You know? That is where culture is being shaped there. Born again, Protestants, INCs, and that thing that they already have their own sets of faith, values, and morals that is different from the other from the other sex. So, ano lang, let's try agree to disagree. But in the end, isa naman natong, uh, isa lang ang patutunguhan natin and choose lang ang uh, our ultimate end is only God. You know? So, 
we have that's why according to Immanuel Kant that I, I'll go back to Immanuel Kant once again that according to him uh, there's only one true religion but there are different kinds of faiths we have only one true religion our religion is our relationship to God but there are different kinds of creeds different kinds of faiths and that's according to Immanuel Kant Okay, thank you. So, let's proceed this. Okay, so I'll give you the example of Nusir Yasin, so also known as Nas Daily. Uh... My religion is better than your religion. My religion is better than your religion. This isn't what I think. This is what a lot of people think. And this is why a lot of people fight. Religious intolerance is one of the biggest problems in the world. But today, I want to show you a country that is trying to fix that. It's a Muslim country in the Middle East that you will never guess. The Emirates. In this Muslim country, you will find a lot of mosques, but you will also find Christian places of worship. 45 churches where Christians can pray. You will find a Gurudwara for the Sikhs to pray, a temple for the Mormons to pray, and a synagogue being built for the Jews to pray. And I'm pretty sure you didn't expect that in Arabia. This is a big deal. So many different types of religions are living next to each other in peace. Take the supermarket, for example. In the Emirates, Muslims don't eat pork. So in the grocery stores, you can't buy it. No pork here, no pork here, and no pork here. But to make life easier for non-Muslims who do eat pork, they added a whole new section to the supermarket where you can buy ham, pork, sausage, or even pastries that secretly have pork. Probably gelatin. Gelatin is made from animals' hooves, so it's the feet of pigs. Even though Muslims don't drink alcohol, non-Muslims can still drink it here, and bars can serve it. But when it's time for prayers, everything must stop to respect the fellow Muslims call for prayers. This signifies that now it's evening. Oh, is that, is that why they do it now? Yeah. That's interesting, I didn't know that. And if you still have any doubts, just look at the mosque behind me. It is called Mary, Mother of Jesus Mosque. And this name was chosen to show respect and tolerance to the churches around it. This is a beautiful system where Muslims and non-Muslims can live together in harmony. That's why last year, the Pope himself came here to hold prayers in the heart of a Muslim nation. And Jews are welcome too. This is a big deal. There is, for the first time in centuries, a new Jewish community established in the heart of the Arab world. It's nothing short of historic. This is the tolerance the world needs. No religion is better than another religion. They are just different. There is still a long way to go for real tolerance here in the Emirates or in the United States or anywhere in the world. We have to work a lot more for real tolerance. But for today, I'm happy we get along. Nice! <laughs> I think that was good. That was good. I think that was good.
okay so here now it's the, uh, it's the advantages of cultural relativism so these are the advantages uh, it is a system that co promotes cooperation creates a society where equality is possible so uh, people can pursue genuine interest respect is encouraged in a system of cultural relativism you know that is why as i told you that despite of our differences to each other we may tend to agree uh, we should agree to disagree diba? So in order for in order to encourage respect next it preserves human cultures cultural relativism creates a society without judgment bawal ang judgmental na yun uh, moral, relativis moral relativism can be excluded from cultural relativism. Why? It's because in a certain particular culture, there is also a set of moral standards which are also different from the other. No? Uh, for example, that um, having a sexual relations with uh, with a 16 year old girl is already considered as um, statutory rape no in the other uh, in the other country but here in the Philippines it's not considered a statutory rape unless if the lady or the girl is 12 years old and below no okay next we can create personal and moral codes based on the societal standards with ease and lastly, it stops cultural conditioning. Okay. So, what are the disadvantages? Uh, cultural relativism so it creates a system that is fueled by personal bias it creates chaos that's why it's very chaotic no? um, it's an idea based on the perfection of humanity it's a lack of diversity it draws people away from one another it could limit moral progress because there's no set of standards no everything is relative it could limit humanity's progress and lastly it can turn perceptions into truth mm. okay so the next one the lesson for the last lesson We'll be considering about the culture of the Filipinos, no? So the Filipino way, customs and traditions. So the first thing here is being presented is uh, this is one of our um, predominant culture, uh, part of our culture, and most common culture. It's considering about the manopo, no? In Tagalog, no? Um, uh, Manopo in Visaya is what we call it as bless uh, in, in derived from the English to bless no so it's a term used when kissing hands of the elders that is that is why we learned that's why as I told you that culture is being learned no and we learned this from the Spanish from the Spaniards no because the Spaniards upon giving respect respect to the ladies, most especially gentlemen, they tend to kiss the hands of those ladies. But here, as what we have learned from the Spaniards, it is passed on through us. But instead of kissing the hands, we put their, their, uh, uh, we up. Uh, first thing is we approached, uh, we approach our elderly, like our parents or grandparents or even our aunts or uncles. Or someone who is elder than us so we ask from their hand and we place their hand on our own forehead so that is mano no? mano po and po is a word that signifies respect no? 
So Filipinos are one of the most hospitable people you may find anywhere. Foreigners are treated with utmost respect. It is a trait that you can't take away from them. And the other one here is manopo, no? kissing the hands of the elders. It's a Spanish word for hand. Well, po is an end sentence no? when addressing elders or superiors. Okay, so here, our next uh, topic here is the, the, our culture. No? Number one is having close family ties. No? Uh, we're so very close with our own, own family. That is one of our own unique traits since Filipinos are considered as family-oriented, family-oriented, no? It is one of the outstanding cultural values that Filipinos have. Family takes care of each other and is thought to be loyal to family and elders by simply obeying their authorities. Authorities. This is one of the unique characteristics of the Filipinos. No? Having fondness for family reunions during secular and religious holidays. Okay, next. So, about wedding, mm -hmm. the culture of wedding, no? So, in a country, marriage is a sacred union between man and a woman after a period of courtship and engagement. No? It is a sacrament between two people who love each other. For many Filipinos, the eternal quality of dedication to God pervades a truly sacred marriage. So a sacred marriage is a covenant between two who love each other in God and with God, whose joining becomes an expression of desire of each to love and serve God together. Okay. Okay, so the next is about death, no? The death in the Philippines is one of the most important occasions in the family life. No? For many Filipinos, a death of the relative is an opportunity to strengthen ties in the family, most especially when someone who is dead, uh, all the members of the family will go there. Okay, so another example, uh, another, uh, another culture here in the Philippines is that um, when somebody is... Uh, when when there's a wake, uh, somebody is dead, no? um, uh, they also believe in the 40 days, no? um, they, because they believe that, based on the Bible, that when Christ, after the resurrection, 40 days after the death of Christ, uh, he ascended into heaven. It's just, it's just the same as with our own souls, that after 40 days, our souls entered into uh, God's judgment and that's also what they believe another death ritual is yung, uh, you, you have to go under no? the, the coffin no? Para, uh, so that the death will not pass on to you in Sagada what you have there in the upper right portion is the Lumiang burial caves where Instead of those um, coffins are being buried underground, but instead they have to hang on the walls of the cave. The higher, as it is a belief, it, that is based on their own culture, it's based on their own belief, that the higher the coffin is being hanged on the walls of the cave, the better. Why? It's because the soul of that dead body will go to heaven. That, and that, that, that is based on your own belief. Okay, next. Bayanihan. Oh, the Bayanihan spirit, no? That is the spirit of... That is the spirit of communal unity or effort to achieve a particular objective. That, that, that is also the basis of... of um, of the government's effort to 
defeat the COVID-19. That is why the administration, the present government, uh, is making uh, has made laws, no? Bayanihan to heal as one, and the other one is the the latest one is Bayanihan to recover as one. Bayanihan one and two. Okay, the next particular culture is the society. Okay. So, primary ancestors of the Filipinos are Malays. Malays, no? So, we have the Malay, Malaysian or even an Indonesian blood who came from the Southeastern Asian country. The Philippines is a combined society, both singular and plural in form. It is singular because it is we are as one nation, but plural in that it is fragmented geographically and culturally. So fragmented types because we have scattered islands. Since it's a scattered island, the culture is quiet. Um, quiet different okay next okay fiestas every town and city in the Philippines has a fiesta of its own whatever the year it is it's sure to be a fiesta going on somewhere so fiestas in the Philippines are held to celebrate a patron saint the best example here is in Cebu the Feast of Senor Santo Nino, and that is the Sinunog Festival. Oh. And the biggest and most elaborated fiest festival of all is Christmas, a season celebrated with all pomp and pageantry. The whole country breaks out celebrations that can begin long before December. Okay, so next one. Oh, <laughs> superstition. Uh, that is from the movie Dead na si Lolo. No? Uh, have you watched that movie? Uh, <clears throat> Dead na si Lolo. Uh, actually, guys, that movie is very funny. It's um, uh, the plot lang is uh, the plot of the story is all about. Yung, uh, different superstitious beliefs no? uh, uh, what the movie is trying to emphasize here that in every superstitious belief uh, is being practiced there uh, you will not <clears throat> you will enjoy a lot of uh, tatawa ka tatawa ka um, actually makatawa jud ka in everything every superstitious belief that is being uh, this being practiced there for example there in that picture Roderick Paulate no? <clears throat> visited uh, he visited the wake of his um, dead na, uh, grandfather no? wearing red <laughs> red gown can you imagine that one that is also a really uh, superstitious belief that nasa that in the wakes or sa patay yun, you're not allowed to wear anything that is colorful especially red no um in going to wakes um uh, actually there are only two colors there it's either black or white so let's uh encourage you guys watch uh try to watch this movie uh, dead na si Lolo no? now um, in the Philippines superstitious beliefs have grown throughout the country these beliefs have come from different sayings, beliefs of our ancestors that aim to prevent danger from happening or to make a person refrain from doing something in particular oh, uh, for example kanang manghinguko sa gabi eh. oh, bawal daw Mm. or otherwise mutaas yun ang imong kuko that is also what uh, what they believe no but actually malagi na that is to prevent danger from happening 
Kung mo ko ka sa gabi, ayaw nila nga masamad ang imuhang ang imuhang kamot. Hmm, di sila ganun nga magdugo. Okay. Next one. <clears throat> oh, courtship. Harana. Oh, so we Filipinos are very romantic when it comes to heart affairs. Serenading or harana in Tagalog is one of the most popular forms of courtship to show that man is very serious with his intentions to a woman. Okay. <laughs> Next. Christmas in the Philippines. Oh, so we are wait. That is one of the best celebrations here in the Philippines. Why? Here in the Philippines, you have the longest Christmas. September pa lang. Pasko na. <laughs> okay, next. Oh, um, religion. Actually, guys, we are the religious. That is why, as I've, as, as I've said before, that the Philippines is the <clears throat> one of the most religious cultures in the entire Southeast Asia, no? And predominantly Roman Catholic, 85% Roman Catholic or 80 to 85%. Okay. So let's proceed now to the next slide. Okay, so what are the characteristics of our Filipino culture? Number one, Filipinos are resilient. In Tagalog, mapagtiis. That in times of calamities, in times of catastrophes, even in COVID-19, Filipinos always manage to rise above the challenge. That despite of the tragedies that happen, we can still manage to smile <laughs> that's what you've seen there the picture next Filipinos help one another that is why bayanihan spirit no we can uh, in times of calamities we also have uh, we have the heart no we have the heart of helping our brothers and sisters who are in need next Filipinos are religious. I already explained that one. Next, Filipinos are respectful. Na manu po nanay, manu po tatay, like that. Next, Filipinos value traditions and culture. Mm. So for Filipinos, traditions in their home and their family are important. They usually set aside a specific day for ce certain celebration like festivals, birthday parties, reunions, and of course every gathering is dedicated to keeping up to each other over some choose food. Uban gani, there's some others that even during the feast day, no, even without money, mangutang pa. <laughs> It just to celebrate, no? Next. Well, of course, being a family-oriented culture, Filipinos take pride in their families. Okay, next. You have the longest... Of course, guys, um... We have the longest Christmas celebration and, and the first thing that comes into your mind when it comes when September sets in is this <laughs> Jose Marichan I'm just a herald of Christmas I'm just a little drummer boy is what he said in the interview well uh, just recently no okay uh, that's why 
Whenever I see girls and boys selling face shields on the streets. <laughs> that is why, guys, we have the longest celebration of Christmas, no? Uh, mostly in our malls. Uh, uh, usually, if COVID, if we don't, if COVID would have, have been happened all around the world. Actually, guys, it's just September 1. Uh, when September 1 starts in all the malls here in the Philippines have already decorated the Christmas uh, Christmas trees you know? um, uh, and we have the longest Christmas Day celebration and most of all um, since it's a longest Christmas celebration we end our Christmas in some other parts like in Manila they ended up during uh, the the feast of Black Nazarene in Metro Manila, but here in Cebu City, our Christmas only ends the third Sunday of January, which is the feast of Senor Santorino and Sinulog, no? And that is that should and that is the last day of the lighting of the the last day of the Christmas tree being lighted in Fuente Osmeña. Okay. Okay, Filipinos love art and architecture. Mm. So, do you know that one? It's a man-made uh, waterfalls that is located in uh, located in Villa Escudero, no, in Chaong Quezon Province. And and actually, guys, um, I've already visited that place. Uh, um, it, that is the first, no. Uh, the first in Southeast Asia that we have a restaurant that is being that is being built along or uh, that is not, not built but that happened all along the man-made waterfalls okay I've been there uh, way back in 2012 in Chaong Quezon province so when I went to Manila at that time or in Quezon City next one Filipinos are hospitable of course so in front of the um, we give respect not only to give respect no but we give them a warm welcome no whenever the foreigners come into our country okay next I don't know what it is. <laughs> Mikey, it's just really good to meet really good you. To meet finally. You. finally. Finally. You know you look you, you know, look you just look, like you your look picture. Like picture. Super cute. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So what are you? So what are you? Chinese? Chinese? Mm -hmm. Japanese? Japanese? <laughs> Mexican. Mexican. Indonesian. Indonesian. Egyptian. Egyptian. I know. I know. You're Indian. Indian. I think it's I so, think cute so cute and kind of flattering. How you're trying to guess what race I am and kind of struggling. No, I am not hybrid. I'm 100%. I-L-I-P-I-N-O I'm Filipino I'm not Latino I'm not Chinese No I'm not from Mexico I'm not from Tokyo I'm Filipino F to the I-L-I-P-I-N-O Goti I can't grow I never look old I speak Tagalog Just look at my nose If it's broad you know I'm Filipino F to the I-L-I-P-I-N-O First I gotta say Just look at my name Mikey Bustos may sound Spanish But there's many clues that indicate to you I'm a Filipino, look at my dish There is so much rice, look into my eyes You will notice the slanted eye slope Here's a Pinoy tip, I point with my lips This is why I'm a Filipino You can tell the difference Just get all your Asian friends Take them to karaoke And the ones that don't stop singing I'm a Filipino, our skin is cold, cold We dance with bamboo, eat halo halo 
I am macho, no. I'm Filipino. F to the I, L I P I N O. I'm Filipino. I eat the You must understand, I eat with my hands You must grab the rice and pack the meat Entering my house, be shy like a mouse Remove your zapatos, the floor's clean Go bless to my mom, try to stay calm She will try to scare you, but just know If you say po, she will know you're cool Cause you're like a Filipino You can tell the difference Gather all your Asian friends Ask them what's this po and if they know it's the the Filipino, I bless to low, low, and I say oh, po, po, respect, you know, I'm Filipino, I'm Filipino, F to the I, L, I, P, I, L, O, my hand will be slow, I bring her in school, the last piece is no, and if I need to, I pull up keto, I'm Filipino, F to the I, L, I, P, I, L, O, I use the bow, 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 And don't ever, don't ever forget, forget it. it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Next. Okay, so let's proceed now. But before that, if you enjoy there, so what what Mikey Bustos being presented here is just only a a glimpse, no, of what Filipino culture is all about, no. Uh, number one is not mentioned there in your textbook is the use of tabo, no, tabo. <laughs> oh yeah, in every in every homes here in the Philippines, you can find it everywhere. <laughs> okay, so let's proceed now to the Filipino family values. So number one is paggalang or respect, no? Uh, to be respectful or to give respect to persons. No? Filipinos are accustomed to using words po, opo, or ho, no? That is in the Luzon. Pero, but here in the Visayas, we cannot say po and opo, but instead, um. Uh, we use the other one which is what we call it hiya no? uh, anyway I will explain that one later but in Visaya we cannot say po and opo but instead um, just only a, uh, speak softly that is already that is already giving respect no? the tone of your the tone of your uh, the tone of your voice is already giving you an idea that that the the low tones or ana uh, give you an idea that that is already giving a respect, no. Uh, next, pagalang respect. Uh, next, pakikisama. It's a connotation of getting along with people in general. This is a general yearning to be accepted and well-liked among Filipinos. 
This applies to one and his or her friends, colleagues, boss, and even relatives. This desire is what steers one to perform pakikisama. So it translates helping others. Therefore, this trait usually fosters general cooperation and performing good or helpful deeds which can lead to others viewing you a favorable light. So that is getting along with the others. Next one is, well, of course, utang na loob, you know, debt of gratitude. So it means to pay your debt with gratitude. <coughs> with utang na loob, there's usually a system of obligation. When this value is applied, it imparts a sense of duty and responsibility on the younger siblings to serve and to repay the favors done to them by their elders. Okay. Next. Pagpapahalaga sa pamilya. So, prioritizing family. <laughs> okay. Next. Okay, damayan system. So, in the Mayan system, we extending sympathy for people who lost their loved ones. That is death, no? We can also extend happiness. It's not only, it's not here in the textbook. We can also extend happiness for a person who is successful, no? Uh, here in this picture, there's a person here who is on the uh, sitting on a wheelchair was the survivor of COVID-19. So what happened there that as soon as he was discharged from the hospital, the frontliners no cheered him and even clapped their hands on him no. So that is the best example here being uh, the Damayan system. So standing sympathy. For others, especially the COVID-19 survivors um, who survive you know, the, this dreadful disease. The next one is Hia. <laughs> okay, so this is the, just only an uh, exaggeration, but uh, just only the bit of my idea there. Hia or shame. So, this controls the social behaviors and interactions of the Filipino. So, it is a value that drives Filipinos to be obedient and respectful to their parents, older siblings, and other authorities. Na, hiya in Visaya means kaulaw, no? And in the Filipino value system, hiya means propriety, no? So, how to behave oneself in a proper place, in a proper time, in the right manner, and in the right time. Okay, next. Oh, so Filipinos are fun-loving. It's a trait found in most Filipinos, a trait that makes them unique, that even times of calamities and challenges in life, they always have something to be happy about a reason to celebrate mm -hmm. so we can manage to smile even even we are still in a pandemic no? so that is one of our positive Filipino values that we have and we can be proud of and lastly is by being compassionate no so filipino trait of being sympathetic to others even the person is a stranger no so example this giving arms to beggars just like the soldier who is giving free uh, free meal to a beggar no uh, a street child no in Jollibee or in a certain fast food this observe we can observe this filipinos would say Luya po niya eh, tabangi po ninyo eh. Kawawa naman, nakakaawa naman. So that is by being compassionate, no? Next.
Okay, so the Filipino social values, no? Number one is the amor propios, or what we call it as self-esteem. It reflects an individual's overall subjective emotional evaluation of his or her own worth. It is the it is the decision made by an individual as an attitude towards self. So, self-esteem encompasses beliefs about oneself as well as emotional states such as triumph, despair, pride, and shame. Define it by saying the self-concept is what we think about self. Self-esteem is the positive or negative evaluations of the self as in how we feel about it. So when we say amor propio, a high regard for self-esteem, no, uh, it also uh, reflects your uh, your reputation as a person. Uh, if you have something, if you uh, you uh, sometimes uh, this is one of the uh, one of the Filipino value system concerning about self-esteem. Know that we try to protect our reputation by giving by giving what is good to others, and that is also one of our basic duties as a as in so far as Filipino value system is concerned. Next one is suki. Mm. You know already about suki. The commercial context, suki relationships may develop between two people who agree to become a regular customer or supplier. The reason because of the number one, the service good service the product is is good so when the product is good the quality and uh, so plus the integrity so therefore the trust uh, the trust is being established now because of that and from there customer loyalty is established that's the suki system no next smooth interpersonal relationships so it's a strong cultural force among filipino in their effort to achieve social acceptance and maintain harmonious relationships okay next is the compadre system no initiated the Filipino into the practice of extended families uh, mm. so I served to strengthen the notorious practice of nepotism that is the the, the negative the disadvantage of a compadre system no? favoritism and social spheres so oppressive oppressive policies of the Spanish colonizers such as forced labor developed in the Filipinos a hatred for manual labor. So, compadre system bonds a ritual kinship sealed in any three of the ceremonial locations, usually in baptism, bunyag, confirmation, or even marriage or kasal to intensify extend personal alliances. So, this mutual kinship system known as Compa, uh, compadre no? compadraj or compadre meaning God parenthood or sponsorship na mga ninong or ninang sa kasal hmm. so maulagi na kung ikaw uh, if you are a politician and if you are married usually your kinship your compadre or your kinship is your or your nino your godfather is usually a rich man a billionaire on an oligarch you know what for what reason self-interest okay next uh, personal alliance system so this scheme is anchored on kinship beginning with the family Oh, so you can look there at the picture. Usually, it is very strong among those people 
whose families uh, are connected with a politician, most especially if the politician is part of their family. So the Filipino loyalty goes first to the immediate family, then the identity is deeply embedded in the web of kinship. It is normative that one owes support, loyalty, and trust to one's own close kin because kinship is structured bilaterally with affinal as well as consanguineal relatives. Ano mga um, in-laws, kung baga in-laws or even imu mga kadugo. One's kin can include quite a large number of people. Still, beyond the nuclear family, Filipinos do not assume or assume the same degree of support, loyalty, and trust that they assume for immediate family members. So, that is the personal alliance system. Next is Otang na Loob. It's, it's already self-explanatory, so I can proceed further. Okay, friendship. So, that is based on the... Uh, that picture was taken at Ayala Center, Cebu uh, a few years back, no? Uh, before we watched the Avengers. And there was somebody who approached us, no? Uh, uh, a U.S. citizen who loves Marvel and he approached us because of what we talked about. So, uh, he shared his interests about the Transformers or even Marvel in which we ourselves are own. So, from there we establish our our friendship there and, and we share the, our own same interests. And afterwards, oh, we took fun in watching the movies inside the three of us. Mm. Okay, so here, uh, friendship, no? Um, that friendship is often placed on at par with kinship, the most central of Filipino relationships. Certain ties among those within one's group of friends are an important factor in the development of personal alliance system. So, the reason why we establish uh, the friendships being developed, one of the one of the factors or the elements that the why the friendship is being established is because number one, we you share the same or the common interest. So that's basically the the base uh, the, the idea there. Next. Okay, so let's proceed further to the weaknesses of the Filipino character. Number one is the extreme family centeredness. Okay. So while concern for the family is one of the Filipinos' greatest strengths, in the extreme it becomes serious flaws, no? Excessive concern for the family creates an in-group to which a Filipino is fiercely loyal to the detriment of concern for the larger community or for the common good. So, the excessive concern for family manifests itself for the use of office and power as a means of promoting the interest of the family. So, uh, usually in marriage, kung kasal na ka, usually married couple still lives within their parents and that is also one of the concern there no hindi pa nagbubuklod and that is one of the problems uh, to be uh, it's one of the disadvantages of having a of having a, of being a filipino oriented culture uh, family oriented culture sorry man. 
Next is passivity or lack of initiative. So acceptance of what happens without active response or resistance. Hmm. Ay. Corrupt na Pilipinas. Wala na tayo po at ala. Pabayaan mo na lang yan. Corrupt na Pilipinas. Wala na tayong magagawa. Let's change the constitution. Ay. What's the point of changing the laws? It's already our personality. That we cannot change. We cannot change it. Na it's part of our blood. Corrupt yun tang tanan. Mo na being passive. Oh, ang tendency sa pagiging passive, mahug ng kita tanan reklamador. Ang dami mong reklamo. Pero ayaw mo naman magbago. Okay. He who wants change. Uh, who wants a social change. Oh, dagan kayo may isas kamot. Oh. Then, who wants to be changed? Wala kayo isa. Ano problema sa ato? Ah, kultura. Mahug na by being passive, by lack of initiative, mahug ta nga puro reklamador. Mm. Boni siya. Guys. Check, check. Dami mong reklamo, ha? Mm. Yo. Ha, ha, ha. Meron din ako reklamo Ang dami dami mong reklamo Ang dami mong gustong magbago Ang dami dami mong reklamo Pero ikaw ayaw mong magbago Ang dami dami mong reklamo Ang dami mong gustong magbago Ang dami dami mong reklamo Pero ikaw ayaw mong magbago Puro ka reklamo sa mantalang ikaw eh Wala ka naman talagang nagawa Mga nagkagaling-galingan at nangangatwiran Kala mo may laman at ang utak mataba Ano akala mo ikaw lang ang nagigirapan Alam mo ba yung iba pang mas malala Habang nasa Maraming nasa kalsada na wala ba kayo't mga nakanganga Iyo, ito ang nagutong na siya Pero marami pa rin sa atin ang bida-bida Bulong na bulong yung iba Kahit tama yung gawin ay sisirain pa nila Lubog na lubog na diba Naranasan mo ba yun o baka rich kid ka Kung wala ka rin matutulong at sasabihin na maganda Mas maganda pa nga naman ay gimmick ka Sasabihin ko na to at wag mong mamasamain Bakit kahit tulungan ka na may reklamo ka pa rin Kung di pa nakakarating ay wag mong mamadaliin Hindi yung pati si Duterte sinisisi nyo pa rin Walang perfecto pero sa reklamo dyan ka magaling na sanay sa ugan Ang dami mong gustong magbago Ang dami dami mong reklamo Pero ikaw ayaw mong magbago Ang dami dami mong reklamo Ang dami mong gustong magbago Ang dami dami mong reklamo Pero ikaw ayaw mong magbago Reklamo, reklamo Puro na lang reklamo Reklamo, reklamo Puro na lang reklamo Reklamo, reklamo Puro na lang reklamo Pansinin mo sa salita O ang daming reklamo Sige na naman ang presidente Magre-reklamo na parang mga pabebe Sinubuan mo na nga ay gusto pa ng bebe Magagalit ta kahit nabigyan mo pa nga siya na ang bente Puro negatibo na palagi Kahit ano ba ito ay merong masasabi Hanganapad ka na mali doon ka madadali Kung kailan ka maging naalam nila saka sila aatake Kung so gusto mo yan diba Alamin at amoyin ang mga baho ng iba Bulok na bulok talaga Kasi ayaw tanggapin yung sariling mali nila Sa salamin tumingin ka kaya Para malaman mo kung sino ang nakakahiya Ang galing nila sa salita Baka na aamoy yung sariling baho ng hininga Sasabihin ko na to at wag mong mamasamain Bakit kahit tulungan ka na may reklamo ka pa rin Kung di pa nakakarating ay wag mong mamadaliin Hindi yung pati si Duterte sinisisi nyo pa rin Walang perfecto pero sa reklamo dyan ka magaling Nasanay sa ugani na bimero pa mabagsakin Pagkatapos masakad yung biglamo pa mababain Paano tatayo ang nakaupo o papadapain? Ang dami dami mong reklamo Ang dami mong gustong magbago Ang dami dami mong reklamo Pero ikaw ayaw mong magbago Ang dami dami mong reklamo Ang dami mong gustong magbago ang dami dami mong reklamo Pero ikaw ayaw mong magbago Reklamo, reklamo Puro na lang reklamo Reklamo, reklamo Puro na lang reklamo Reklamo, reklamo Puro na lang reklamo Pansin
sini mo sa salita o oh, ang daming reklamo. Okay. <laughs> Have you enjoyed that song? <laughs> that rap? Reklamo. Oh. Even in Manila Bay, oh, daghan kay uh, daghan kayo mga request sa so, una kita may nga tanga um, kinsa to'y mo build um, mga bridges o sige atong butuhan karon na nga nanay Manila Bay pangitaan pag buslot astag that is by being passive that is one of our negative our negative character traits as a Filipino nakakahiya okay next Oh, you know this guy. Oh, <laughs> comic strip. Mm, you know this? By being extreme personalism. <laughs> oh. Because in this personalistic worldview, a view of the world, uh, Filipinos have difficulty in dealing with all forms of personal stimuli. Uh, personal relationships, for example, no? to the extent that to which one is able to personally relate things and people determines the recognition of their existence and value given to them. So there is no separation between objective task and emotional involvement. So personalism is manifested in the tendency to give personal interpretations to action. In other words, taking things personally. Para bagi personala na nimo ang usaka issue. The best example here is this guy, Trianis. You know this picture on the left? It goes back 2015 when he visited Davao and he uh, approached Duterte that he is willing to run for vice president and he asked Duterte to run and oh no he asked Duterte to be his running mate but what was Duterte's response sorry I won't accept your offer no but what happened when april uh, a month before election came in april asi duterte my billions of accounts a bpi julia barga account but pero uh, when his lawyer sal panelo went Uh, to BPI oh challenge there was a challenge okay Trillanes we will meet each other at the bank Julia Varga uh, branch of BPI but what happened was that it turned out wala billions wala wala <laughs> What's the reason behind his hatred for Duterte? The main reason of his hatred is because of that picture that Duterte did not uh, that, that, the, that Mayor Duterte did not uh, accept his offer. So, He took the issues seriously, personally, against the person who rejected his offer. Taking things personally. Oh. Duterte's father helped he fix his bar exam. Gikuan na. Iyahang pagkaabogado, peke na. Gifix na. But Duterte's father died in 1968. But Duterte passed the bar exam in 1972. Um, fake news pa. okay next so that is why guys 
Extreme personalism leads to graft and corruption that is evident in the Philippine society. Just what is happening today. Um, the power power grabbing in the Congress no, between Cayetano and Velasco. Oh. It's Velasco. Pirmi lang absent sa Congress. But when it comes to budget na, wow, present. And now he is now asking for koan? And now he is asking for for house speakership but he didn't know how to handle it uh, have you listened to a speech of Cayetano uh, uh, the President Duterte pwede December na lang because the the purpose is para ang budget may pasa no ingon si Velasco no 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 gusto ko October 14 gusto ko Sige naman, pre, para na lang sa bayan yan. Ayaw mo. No, no, gusto ko sa, Fe- sa October 14. O, oh, February 14 eh. October eh. Sorry. October 14. Hmm. What happened? Awa na. Nagkaka-problema na. Oh, so... What will happen here? Ama na, magkakaproblem ha, Junta. And according to, kaya mo ba, Lord Velasco? The problem with Velasco is that he's not serving for the interest of the Philippines. He's just there for his own interest. Kaya ko yan. <laughs> That's what he said, no? Next. So, of course, another thing here to consider is the lack of discipline. Mm. Okay, lack of discipline. Number one is that uh, our lack of discipline often results in efficient and wasteful work systems, violations of rules, leading to more serious transgressions, the casual work ethic leading to carelessness, lack of follow through. Mm. And what's the reason behind the lack of self discipline? It's because of procrastination. Oh, kanang unya unya lang ba? The lack of willpower, wala motivation, ambition that causes for lack of self-discipline. So, money, ah, unya na lang sana eh. Anyway, ko ano bitaw na. The lack of state of health might also lead to weakness in this important ability. So, that is the reason behind the lack of discipline. Next one, is colonial mentality. Filipino savvy colonial mentality which is made up to two dimensions first is a lack of patriotism and of active awareness and appreciation on the love of the Philippines the second is actual preference of things that are foreign over local 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 goods no we choose the uh, we choose the foreign goods as superior over our goods that are made from local no so that is one of our negative attitude i love the philippines omg proud pinoy forever and ever be that oh and i give it up there is a hostage taking in manila blah 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 Ah, I hate the Philippines. Ay, layas ko din eh. Adto na lang ko sa Korea. Mm. I love the Philippines. Pero mahilig pala sa K-pop. <laughs> no. That's, that's all. The idea. For me, uh, just an example on my own part. No, that 
uh, concerning about colonial mentality issue. Mm. Uh, sorry guys, but in my own part, I really love foreign uh, Hollywood movies rather than Filipino movies. The reason? It's because our Filipino movies lack of support. Uh, so that is why guys, uh, concerning uh, concerning about the quality films, um, I much more adhere towards Hollywood movies over Filipino ones. But it doesn't mean that I, but yeah, it's one of my negative connotations, no, with regards to our Philip, with the, with regards to our our own. So for me, that our films. Uh, in the Philippines should be uh, dapat yun na siyang tagaan o pagtagat especially with the government uh, tagaan yun na siyang funding I give you one of the best example no? uh, do you know in South Korea the K-pop when they released the movie Parasite and that movie Parasite became a golden uh, became an Oscar award no it's because that that movie was funded by their own government in which our government did not that is one of the reasons there that's one of the reasons why our movie is so very corny na gyud kaayo siya nagkaduga nagka corny gyud no? So, the, uh, in order for uh, for me, on my own part, uh, our Filipino movies should be um, dapat yun, uh, well fund yun as a government, and there should be I adhere to the quality yun, my yun nga quality with regards to the Filipino movies. For me, guys, the best. Filipino movies are those movies made by the independent directors, dep independent scriptwriters, that is why indie films. So I much more adhere to indie films rather than on films that are produced on the mainstream, uh, mainstream film producers like The Viva, The Regal, Star Cinema, wala na na siya. Indie films for me are the best. So if you want me to uh, to support Filipino movies, for me guys, indie films are the best. Okay. Next. Oh, another thing here is crab mentality. Utak talangka. The phrase crime mentality is used to describe if I can have it, neither can you mindset. The metaphor refers to a pot of crabs that could easily get out, but they ensure their own demise. But competitively clawing at each other like spiteful humans trying to bring down those who are more successful by diminishing their importance the best example is our present our present government today when somebody leads the government somebody has to put him down ah, that's the the best example here the 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 picture the upper left corner the administration is trying to establish the state the uh, to establish a stable peace and order and booming economy of the Philippines. But some others would say the detractors would pull him down. No? What, for what purpose? It's because of the interest. Self-interest. That is why, guys, I could tell you that the Philippine politics is not a battle between good or evil. Philippine politics is a battle of self interests Mona siya. just an example here when our president was in June for uh, for upgrade no 
concerning about our charter change, constitutional change. But the other says, I there's no need for change. Okay, ng constitution. Okay, ng 1907 constitution. That is by being passive. Yeah, that that is crab mentality. Mm. Okay, another thing here. Lack of self-analysis and reflection. Oh. In the face of serious problems, both personal and social, there's a lack of analysis or reflection. Joking about the most serious matters prevents us from looking deeply into the problem. There's no felt need to validate our hypothesis or explanations of things. Hmm. Oh. So, there's a tendency in the Filipino to be superficial and even somewhat flighty. No? In the face of serious problems, both personal and social, there's a lack of analysis or reflection. Related to this is a Filipino emphasis on form rather than on substance. Puro lang paporma. Mm. Just like the example here. No? Bikoy? <laughs> oh. When he turned, but katongan ni baliktad na siya, nilahi na ko ah. O oh, noon at ngayon, no? The other one here. Vice President Lenny Robredo said in the other day that she wants to help the government. Girl, you want to help the government? Para dili ma, 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 malumo sa COVID-19. Girl, you had your chance last 2016 when, you, when the president gave you the, uh, the position in the housing. no? But what happened? During the meeting... Oh, unsa may gibuhat ni Mulini? During the meeting, okay, kontra ka ng kontra there, but you attended the meeting, pero um, you you give respect to those people or the the cabinet members who are there in the meeting with the president. But the problem here is that when you came, when you went outside the when you went outside, imo silang gidaot. Ibastos pa mo sila, girl. How can you be able to help with the government if you are not there? No? And that is the problem with Lenny Robredo. She lacks self-analysis and even self-reflection there. How can... Now, <coughs> she has an ambition to run for presidency in 2022. How can she be able to win in the government when most of the people in the Philippines did not like her. Oh, nah. I give you an example. Okay. Yang gikuda si Duterte. Oh, kuda siya ng kuda. Uh, banat siya ng banat. Pero kung ang mga supporters ni Duterte babanatin siya, she calls them trolls. Oh, how can she can how uh, how can she be able to win if the if the voters I call him trolls call her trolls problem by 2022 hmm. so if I were you uh, if I were you Lenny um, actually be like couple no in this case no. Uh, I just get this example from from Arginieto, no, a thinking Pinoy, about this. But he's actually right in saying this, that Lenny Robredo has a difficulty of of getting sympathizers because of what she did, no, in face or in front of the UN, she destroyed 
our the image of our country and also the palit ulo scheme kuna hmm. siya head swapping okay next Oh, gaya gaya attitude. You are nothing but a second rate, trying hard copycat. Oh, that is one of the negative or Filipino characteristics, no? By being um, gaya gaya, no? So, a Filipino attitude of imitating or copying other culture, specifically in the mode of dressing, magpa-dress, dress lang. Para lang, looking dato, looking guapo, looking dato, um, sa bisag walay kwarta mo, palit og iPhone X, or iPhone X Plus, para lang paporma, pa-impress. Yun na na. <laughs> oh, language, Oh, fashion, trend, or even haircut. Oh, well, bito, uh, that is why at that time there was a trend. Then the haircut trend was uh, uh, mohok, no? Mohok. So, so, by satanan. O oh, kung ang artista mag arios dari, arios po tanan. So, that is one of the great problems facing our Filipino character. Next one is the Ningas Kugon. A Filipino attitude of being enthusiastic only during the start of new undertaking but ends dismally in accomplishing nothing. In other words, mabuti lang kung sa uh, mabuti lang, mabuti lang kung sa uh, sa simula, pero sa Uh, sa kinalaunan, wala na. Oh. May lang sa sinugdanan. Okay, next. Kanya-kanya syndrome. It's also evident in the personal ambition and drive for power. Oh, status that is completely insensitive to the common good. So it results in the dampening of cooperative and community spirit. Ah, naman ka. So you'll be, you tend to become uncooperative. I want to cooperate in the government to avoid the failure of the government in the facing COVID-19. Pero siya rin nagsulo. Oh. And the denial of rights of others. Just look at the example there in the picture. Oh. When the president is trying to say in the sauna, but here goes, si VP Lenny, nagkakalat. Oh, inunahan pa niya si Duterte. Pero iyang ipang istorya niya, ipang sulti niya, wala na, na, na humanan, eh, tabo na. So that is, uh, that is one of the toxic, no? Filipino characteristics that we have that we that we have that and in which that all Filipinos suffered no Okay so that's all That's the end of the entire lengthy chapter 3. <laughs> oh no, chapter 2 day. And please don't forget to like and share and subscribe to my YouTube page. So thank you very much. <laughs>